start recording. And then I'm also going to um, start streaming. Um, I'm just gonna make sure that this is going. Okay. Wow, simple as that. I think so. <laughs> So I think we are now streaming and uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. My name's Charles Chang. I am on the Emerging Scholars. Wow, Network. simple as that. I think so. <laughs> oh, let me. So I think we are now, mute that. This always happens when I stream. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am Charles. I'm on the Emerging Scholars Organizing Committee here at BU Linguistics along with Kate Lindsay and Denny Erker. And um, along with the colloquium committee, Megan Brown and uh, Jenya Lukin, we are the organizers of this event, uh, which features our first speaker of the semester. And I won't say very much, I'll just turn it over to Professor Lindsay, who will be introducing our speaker. Thanks so much, Charles. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Megan Figueroa as our first colloquium speaker um, of this year. Dr. Figueroa received her PhD in linguistics from the University of Arizona um, for her dissertation, which explores how children learn the rules of language, like how they learn how to distinguish categories of words like nouns and verbs, and how they use regular patterns in the language to build words so they can say more and more complex sentences. Megan has been conducting research with the Tweedy Language Development Lab since 2014. And she has co-hosted a podcast about linguistic discrimination called The Vocal Fry Since 2017. She gives talks nationally on topics such as developmental psycholinguistics and linguistic discrimination. And we are so honored to have her here speaking to us today. So let's give a virtual round of applause for our speaker, Megan Figueroa. Thank you. Did, sorry, someone muted me, or maybe it was me. I'll just blame someone else. That's terrible. Uh, thank you, Kate and Charles, um, for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I see all these participants here. Um, what are you doing with your time? You're here with me? I'm grateful, but... <laughs> all right, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. All right, and then... There we go. Does it look okay? Awesome. Okay, so I'm here in Tucson right now, and I just want to acknowledge that I'm on um, Tohono O'odham land. Um, and then I also, from the start, want to say um, that over-regularizations, um, these past tense over-regularizations that I'm going to be talking about today, are not over-regularizations in all dialects of English. Um, they are forms like braked or catched can be found in some varieties, and that's part of their grammar. So what I'm looking at today are um, the over-regularizations, the forms that are over-regularizations in some varieties of, of English. So just wanted to say that and just um, to remember that um, when you leave here. Okay, so here's a roadmap for what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to start with a goal and then introduce you to the problem and then go over a behavioral study that I did with three different conditions. And then we'll pause to re-examine the problem. And then I will introduce a corpus study that I'm currently working on. Um, and then we'll have conclusions, future directions, and a thank you. Okay, so my goal for this talk is to make you rethink everything you know, um, or think you know about the English past tense. Um, just, you know, I mean, perhaps the only thing you know about the past tense is that you use it to talk about the past, um, because not everyone spends 10 years studying the past tense like I have. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll give you something, something to think about. Um, and yeah, okay. So we're going to start with the B problem um, that Chomsky uh, talked about in 1959. Um, initially, the poverty of the stimulus. So this is kind of like an age old question. Um, you know, how do children go beyond um, what they hear in their linguistic environment to learn their language? Because not every 
sentence or form that they will eventually um, say or sign is actually something that they've heard, right? So um, how do we, so how do children solve that problem? And the way that they do, that we know that they do solve this problem somehow is that we can look at generalization. So when children learn a language, a, a language rule, they apply these rules to an overly broad set of words. And one example of this is English past tense overregularizations in some varieties of English. So forms like breaked and catched. Now, these happen in production around two or three years old is when they usually start. So um, children will hear forms like walked and talked and jumped and they will deduce that I, if they can, they can then say I breaked it um, because they see that this ED is co-occurring with other verbs in their language. So they then think that they can add the ED to all verbs in, in English. Okay, so another thing that generalization tells us about is categorization. So um, when they apply these rules to an overly broad set of words, um, AKA overregularized, that means that they had categor categorized these words in some way. So they've created clusters of words that occur in the same distributional context. So they hear for, um, sentences like, I walked to the park, um, the dog is running, the girl jumps high. So they are seeing that um, verbs can co-occur with the, um, the, the third person S, the I and G, um, and then the ED, and they then decide um, again that they've categorized, got, categorized verbs into forms that take these, these, these morphemes. Um, and we know that they're doing this because they don't do things like add ED to nouns. Um, when they start overproducing or overregularizing, um, they don't say things like bananaed. Um, it just doesn't happen. So that is one other way we know that they are categorizing into some sort of proto category uh, that says that verbs can take these forms and nouns can't and determiners won't. Um, so my And what this all means, and it leads to the problem that we're going to look at today, is that when kids do this, when they've decided that this is a rule that you add ed to a verb in English, they have decided this over a gap in a paradigm. So let me talk about that. Okay, so there are two types of gaps, linguistically motivated and accidental. So the English verbal paradigm is, includes a linguistically motivated gap. Um, these are gaps that are required by the grammar. So we have irregular verbs that do not take the ED in some, dial, in some varieties of English. So there's a gap there where the ED does not co-occur um, with say catch or run. Um, so there's the gap. Um, okay. And, oops. Okay, and then the English verbal paradigm can also include accidental gaps. So here's an example um, from the Corpus of Adam from Brown, 1974, 70 something, um, the iconic Adam, um, 1973. Okay, and um, this is from the, the caregiver speech. Um, I took all of the verbs from the caregiver speech um, and 52 language samples and just picked some verbs. And um, as you can see here, there are the linguistically motivated gaps for, for words, verbs such as break and catch. But we also see something like dance um, never being produced with the ED. Um, and of course, I'm not trying to say that Adam never heard the word dance, but just to say that children have to generalize away from the specific input that they are given to, again, going back to the poverty of stimulus, um, learn their language. Okay, like I said, this is happening around two or three. Um, we start hearing forms like breaks and catched. Um, but what I'm here today to talk about, talk about is what if they're doing this earlier? What if children, before they even start producing um, verb forms that have morphemes attached to them, that they're actually over-regularizing in perception. Um, 
So uh, this idea that English learning children would have this receptive knowledge that ED can attach to verb stems before they're two or three and can produce forms like breaks means that they have to have a certain set of abilities. Um, they have to be able to perceive the distributional relationships of grammatical morphemes and um, uh, lexical morphemes. So they have to be able to be sensitive to the fact that verb can go with ed or that noun can go with s. Um, and studies suggest, many, many studies, and I just wanted to, to make a point, and I put a ton of citations there, that people have been looking at this for a long time. That, that children under the age of 24 months or 18 months even are able to um, encode patterns of both adjacent co-occurrence, which happens by 12 months. Um, so like verb plus ed would be within the adjacent co-occurrence and patterns of non-adjacent co-occurrence by 18 months. So something like um, the was running, so the was plus the ing, um, these non-adjacent co-occurrences are happening by 18 months. So children are able to detect these in their input and in experimental studies. Um, so, actually, let me go back there. Um, so, they're able to do this in laboratory um, exposure. So, if we give them an artificial language that's something like determiner plus noun, um, they're able to then, during tests, um, prefer the determiner and nouns that are meant to be together. We know this by testing um, their own language and legal versus illegal co-occurrences. They don't like it when something co-occurs that's not supposed to. And we also know from computational studies that um, successful categorization just based on distributional co-occurrence patterns is possible. Okay. So my big question then is, can we manipulate the English past tense over regularizations to see if children categorize these morphemes earlier than their productions suggest? Um, and I say, yes. <laughs> so, all right. All right. So we know that they have the, the prerequisite abilities. They know, we know that they are able to perceive these co-occurrence patterns several months to a year before um, the research on child um, children's productions provide evidence for this category of verb or proto-category of verb. Um, and we can then use or manipulate the English past tense over regularizations to probe whether or not they've categorized, um, they've made some sort of proto-verb category by seeing how they treat the paradigmatic gaps in their input. So. Basically, I'm asking, do they see the English verbal paradigm as a linguistically motivated gap, um, or do they see it as an accidental gap? And they're like, okay, it's accidental, which means that ED does go with break. ED does go with run. Okay, and I'm going to test 16 month olds because it's in that sweet spot, sweet spot between 12 months and 18 months where we know they have this kind of disability but they're not producing um, these forms at all. In fact, they only have a few verbs at this point. Um, and it's there are things like go and, you know, they're not co-occurring with morphemes. Okay. <laughs> so basically I, I think it's really helpful to think of it this way. I'm asking, okay, children, this child language learner has their linguistic input. Do they think that the fact that they've never heard catched mean does that mean it doesn't exist or is it it was accidental or is it a gap um that's basically the question i'm asking um and that means also are these children biased towards generalization which means they're gonna think um okay it's accidental so i'm just gonna generalize over the gap and produce forms like break and we've seen studies of five to seven year olds that um if you give them an artificial language where they create inconsistencies between the the nonce or the the fake determiner and the fake noun um, they will generalize over the inconsistencies and just say this i heard it once this exists i'm doing it um, but we don't see it much with younger kids um, and in fact there's actually pretty sparse evidence that they can do this at 16 months there are two studies they're in german and in french where 14 to 16 month olds were able to do this type of um, 
generalization over a gap, but only with noun forms. So they were not able to do it with verbs. So I'm kind of asking, okay, well, I've seen that they can't really do it with verbs, but maybe that's a German and French thing, or, you know, let's, let's try it with English. So um, this is kind of the first to do that with English. Okay. All right. Behavioral study. Okay. So how are children handling these gaps? Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so again, the question is, are they treating these linguistically, these, these gaps in the paradigm as linguistically motivated differences between um, regular and irregular verbs, or do they think it's just accidental? Um, that they just haven't heard it in their input because, you know, they haven't heard in the input and not because it doesn't exist. So my hypothesis is that children um, learning English at 16 months know enough about grammatical morphemes and grammatical categorization to represent verb plus ed um, as possible in their grammar. Um, they will incorrectly then represent forms like breaked as possible in their dialect of English. Um, th that is to say that they think that ED is a reliable enough marker um, that they can add it to every verb. So if they have encoded the past tense morpheme um, as correctly co-occurring with an irregular verb form, then they should listen longer to the stimuli containing these over-regularized forms uh, based on familiarity with the co-occurrence pattern of verb plus ed. Okay, so for all three conditions that I'll show you today, I use the head turn preference procedure, which um, if you're familiar at all with child language studies, you know that this is kind of, you know, what you do, what you use um, to figure out what kids are doing at this age. Um, I just remember the first time I saw this work it was just like a miracle. Like I didn't, science is beautiful. I didn't know that we could learn this way. So what happens is the children are in a booth sitting on their caregiver's lap. And there are, um, uh, on the right and the left, there are um, speakers that will play the stimuli. Um, and there, there are also lights because it's hard to keep an attention of a 16 month old. Um, but they will attend to these sounds. They'll look the direction. And what we do is we measure the listening time to the stimuli. And the reason why it's, you know, both sides and then we randomize the stimuli, we just wanna make sure there's no preference toward a side. Um, Cause some kids will just like look left and then they'll never move. So, you know, we get rid of that. Okay, so basically that all sum up, sums up to the head term preference procedure allows us to discriminate or to tell if the infants discriminate patterns that Co that conform or don't conform to their language. So we'll give, you know, in this case, what I'm actually asking is, do they pref prefer these non-adult-like forms of over-regularized uh, past, past tense? Okay. All right, so the participants are also going to have the same um, demographic information and, and all that. So they are all between 15 and a half and 16 and a half months from English speaking homes. These are monolingual children, um, no history of hearing or speech language disorder, um, no ear infections, because that can affect the way they hear um, the stimuli. Um, and then they're full term and they have to weigh a certain weight. So that's just the way it goes in the field. And they did not produce any past tense forms, correct or not, which was determined by an in-house questionnaire that I made that basically just had a bunch of verb forms and asked parents if they've heard their children produce these. And in fact, with like the 16 participants, I think only one or, you know, one or two or three parents um, had even said that they were producing verbs at that point. Okay. So this is a big graph of a lot of stuff, but I just wanted to have it here in case you know, later we have questions when I go back to it. But what's gonna happen is um, over the three conditions, there are going to be 16 um, sentences total. Um, the first will always be the, or the, um, 
the first type of sentence will always be the over-regularized. Um, so the ones on the far left. Um, and then through the three conditions, there's gonna be a comparison stem of eight sentences and we'll go through each. Okay, experiment one. All right, so here we're going to compare the overregularized forms to phonotactically match nonce verbs. So verbs that um, given the, the sound sequences, um, they're gonna be as closely matched as we can to the overregularized forms that they're um, being compared with. And so something like Snoopy catch the balls, um, Snoopy brooked the ball. So we're using the same carrier sentence in all of them. And my prediction is that 16 month olds are gonna listen longer or prefer um, the overregularized forms because these are, this is familiar to them. It's familiar to them that you can add the verb in ED. Okay, so the results here are beautiful, as beautiful as you can get with children. <laughs> so 16 toddlers, 14 out of 16, listen longer to the overregularized. Um, and like I said, that's that was really striking to me. Um, but there may be a artifact of the design. What if it's just that they're listening longer to these forms because they're familiar? So the verb is familiar because it's a real verb. ED is familiar because they've heard it on verbs before. Okay. Um, what if just that confluence of those two familiar things is what was driving it and not the fact that they knew that ED could be attached to these verbs. So let's get rid of that artifact. We're then going to compare these overregularized forms to English nouns plus ED. All right. Um, so Snoopy catch the ball versus something like Snoopy booked the ball. Um, and a comment here that I know that we could say something like, I booked that, I don't know, performance, whatever, um, in English. So English has this beautiful quality where we can like make everything a verb. Um, but, you know, there's, I, I <laughs> um, it's very unlikely that children at 16 months are hearing these verbs or that many um, instances of these, these forms and that uh, it's unlikely that they are registering this as a distributional pattern. Um, so I have some citations for that too, um, if you want that later, but it's just very unlikely that they would think from their experience that an ED can go with, with book or truck, or I think crib is another one that I used. Okay, so again, I think that they're gonna listen longer to over-regularized forms. Um, and again, the addition of the nouns means that we are, I'm trying to get rid of the idea that the only reason why they listen longer to over-regularized was because of a familiarity, pref um, the confluence of familiarity of verb plus ed. If anything, at this age, nouns should be more familiar in English. Most of you know their vocabulary at this stage is gonna be nouns anyway. And brilliantly, beautifully, again, 14 out of 16, toddlers listen longer to the overregularized stem, thus ruling out this possibility that they're just responding to the confluence of verb plus ed, the familiarity of that, since the nouns and the verb should be equally familiar. Again, if anything, the nouns are more familiar. Um, and children, then um, my conclusion here is that they're responding to the structure verb plus ed. Okay, so the last experiment is, I think the obvious next step, which was, okay, well, what are they doing when we compare the correct counterpart? So um, when I first did this, I thought, oh, you know, my design is so brilliant. The overregularized forms are going to win again. It's gonna be just beautiful. Um, that's not what happened. Um, so yes, nine out of 16 listened longer. Um, but there was no significant difference. So I think what's happening here is that they believe that both of these forms are okay in their grammar. Um, it's unclear if they think that they can both be used in the same way. Um, that would be a future direction here. But it seems to me that they, they think that both are okay, probably because they've heard forms like caught and broke. 
Um, so that's okay. But again, my going back to my thesis that they've also heard walked and talked, so they think he can go with verbs. Okay. So to kind of before we get back to re-examining the problem here, let's discuss what this all means. Um, so okay. Okay, so months before children are producing ED um, or producing over regularizations if it's in their dialect, um, they represent verb plus ED. They're doing this in reception. They're doing this at 16 months. Um, they're doing this before they have many verbs in their vocabulary. Um, and this also strongly suggests that they treat the English verbal paradigm or the morphemes, the S, the I, and G, and ED, um, as like sufficiently associated um, that they expect that the ED is accidental and that just because there's no examples of catch in the input, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So they go ahead and think this is an accidental gap and generalize over the gap and think that forms, they, these non-adult like forms in their dialect are part of their grammar at this point. And again, experiment three suggests that um, they, they think that both broke and break are okay at this stage. Okay, a little pause here for re-examining the problem. Okay, so at this stage in child language development, cognitive science, all of that, these overregularized productions have been argued to reflect a period of reorganization of a child's knowledge of language, a complete shift in what they know, because they prefer they per, if they produce forms like breaked. That means that they have learn some sort of role or some sort of extraction or you know have enough co-occurrences um, whatever you want to call what they're doing here um, so i know some people don't like the word roles um, that they have some sort of shift in knowledge but since these forms don't show up until three or four um, i had to ask is it possible that they know these before i mean you know one of the things that i first learned in child language development is that kids know so much more than they can produce. Um, so they're doing so much more before they start producing forms. The, the perception um, that we have two modalities, perception and production, and we should not ignore perception. So um, what these three conditions, this experiment, behavioral experiment showed is that given, given that, this idea that there's a shift or reorganization of child's knowledge, we're missing really important information um, about the developmental trajectory because we're ignoring perception. Okay. And what has happened up to this point, long before I was born, just decades, decades, um, the past tense overorganization is described as a U-shaped learning function. So if you've taught Ling, or psychology, or if you've taken 101, you probably have heard of overregularizations. Um, it's even if it's not a language acquisition class, these things are iconic in the literature, and it's up until this point has been described as this U-shaped learning function, which has three stages. So the first stage is just memorization of irregulars. So what happens is kids will hear caught and broke. And they'll just memorize it and they'll, we'll, they'll use it and we'll hear them using it. Um, but then there's this regression in the second stage um, after there's supposedly a shift in their knowledge, a reorganization of the system where they have learned or abstracted that ED can go with verbs. So now they're over applying it to irregulars and we get these over regularizations. And so we have a dip in performance from ceiling. Um, and then third stage, we, they fix the problem by rememorizing irregulars and then we're back up to um, them having adult-like uh, productions in their dialect. But my suggestion here is that this is a fairy tale. So this is where I give myself so much credit 
um, where I think well-deserved <laughs> that um, by ignoring perception all these years, we've been telling ourselves a fairy tale about a very important aspect of, of English, uh, English learning infants and children and what they're able to do. And um, so again, 16 months, months before we see these in production, um, we are, there's evidence that they can do this. Okay, so that's where I'm at. Okay, wait one more. Okay, um, so let's ignore my beautiful behavioral study. Um, and just, here's another reason why we should question this narrative, this fairy, fairy tale narrative that I call it. Here are, again, going back to the iconic Adam, um, Sarah, and there's Eve as well, but she doesn't, uh, she left the study. Um, and there's not much data, as much data from her. But Adam and Sarah, you see that we have this over from like two years old to five years old. These are the over-regularization rate um, across their development. And I just put the, the U-shaped learning graph on the side there. If there's some sort of reorganization in this system, shouldn't we see bigger dips? Um, I mean, that's enough to question what's happening here. We don't see these big dips. What we're seeing are really small, um, small dips from ceiling performance. I mean, like micro U shapes. Um, I think that was uh, Marchman, 1993, that said they called them micro U shapes. Um, this is not a system wide failure. These are these, um, if it were some sort of transition in organization or uh, transitional period or reorganiz reorganization of the morphosyntactic system, shouldn't we see? Um, system-wide failure, but we don't see that. So that is a reason to question um, the kind of simplistic uh, textbook narrative that we've been seeing before with over-regularizations, even if we were to ignore my behavioral study. So here's the corpus study, which is um, exciting work that I've been working with Dr. Julia Fisher, and then my mentor and advisor, Dr. Luan Gerken, who's helped me with the behavioral study as well. Um, this is newer stuff, it's in progress. Um, and um, so I, I, it's exciting, <laughs> so we'll see. Okay, so, all right. What is the nature then of the development of the irregular past tense over longitudinal data? Is it best described as this U-shaped learning function? Um, and can we then estimate the likelihood of over-regularization over based on qualities that are inherent or unique to the verb? or individual child instead of the morphosyntax, instead of saying this was some morphosyntactic learning. Okay. So I'm not saying that when we see over-regularizations that, you know, they're not adding a rule. That's not what I'm saying. Um, or add, you know, following some sort of rule. What I'm, what I'm saying is that I think that there are external variables that are at play that are working together to influence when we see these in production. So I think they'll interact and play an important role in estimating these over organizations when they will appear in, in speech across development. Okay, so I used um, two monolingual English speaking children from the child's database, Adam and Sarah. Again, Eve was initially in it, but she didn't have enough data. Um, but she was very precocious. She over-regularized really soon. So that's, you know, very interesting. But okay, so past tense forms um, of irregular verbs, both correct and over-regularized, were tabulated for each child. Okay, and a mixed logistical regression model um, was fit to this over-regularization data. And so Dr. Fisher is who's, you know, the statistician here. So if I say something that's confusing, um, it's on me and not on her. Um, okay, so here are um, the variables that we decided on um, given the literature. Um, so there are um, three different functions. First, the linguistic sophistication of the child. Um, and so this is measured in so many ways in the literature, 
it's confusing and what's the best i don't know um so i did three of the you know most typical ones age just chronological age mean length of utterance which is um in morphemes so just how long how many morphemes in utterance um the type token ratio which is just an index of lexical diversity for the um, child. And then the one that I'm excited about was article use. So I uh, this is a way to kind of determine where children are in their development, because when articles show up um, in productions, they don't, kids do not use them incorrectly. They use them with their noun, with nouns. They, so, and this is Valian's work, um, and many others, but when they do show up, they show up um, adult-like. Okay. Um, second function, how difficult is the word to pronounce? Um, you know, again, another thing, thinking about how we have two modalities um, and children know more than they can produce. I mean, just thinking about fine motor skills and everything that has to develop. What if how difficult something is to pronounce affects what they pronounce? So. Bono tactics, something I didn't think I cared about or ever wanted to think about, um, and yet I love her now. Um, okay, so phono tactics, basically what are the legal co-occurrences of sounds in a language? Um, so like the STR, the strike or whatever in English is kind of, you know, pretty uncommon in other languages and people have trouble with that sequence, that, that consonant cluster at the beginning of words, right? Um, so there are two different ways that measure phonotactics, positional and biphone. Positional is just how likely is it that the D sound is going to be at the beginning of a word or in the middle or in the end. And biphone is how likely are these two sounds to co-occur in this part of a word. Okay. And th this, of course, I thought was particularly important because, you know, adding a morpheme to the end of the word, wouldn't it be really important if we're adding a T or D sound or ED sound for the, the past tense? If um, when we add that to a verb, it makes it particularly difficult to pronounce, right? So that's why I thought biphone was particularly important. And then lastly, the what is the word like compared to other words? So lexical frequency, is it a frequent word? Um, and then neighborhood de um, density, meaning how many um, words are similar to it. So there's research that if a, um, you know, non fake word in, um, um, is given to a child that has a low neighborhood density, the more likely to um, reproduce it correctly because there's less, um, you know, competition in, in their lexicon to produce it. And so what's important here is that, um, so, and also um, I checked to see what each of my verb, uh, which over regularized forms versus correct forms or adult like forms um, had sparser neighborhoods and overall over regularized forms had much sparser neighborhoods. So given the research, you might think that these are more likely to be produced since there's less competition. Okay. So just the simplest measure of all I just want to point out again that overregulation rate is so low. It's a very low rate. And I just want to point that out again because, again, this is not system wide failure that's happening. Um, this is, yeah, this is not happening with every verb that a child produces. In fact, there were, I mean, it's not, it wasn't super common, but there were some um, sentences from a child where they'd actually use both forms in the sentence. <laughs> They'll say braked and broke in the same sentence. Okay, sorry about the quality of this. I don't know what happened, um, but I just wanted to show this again as reiteration that there's not system-wide failure. Um, Adam and Sarah, when I plot the over or the over-regularization rate um, across frequency, the less frequent forms on the left um, and in the middle, you know, that, that's where we see over organization. We don't really see it on the right when forms are very frequent. Yeah. Quality. Okay. Again, sorry about the quality. Um, okay. So let's just try mean length of utterance. 
Um, when we do that with both Adam and Sarah, um, again, we see a ton on the, the zero, there's no organization across main length of utterance. Um, we see it more on the right side when they're getting older, um, you know, more input or, you know, several factors could be at play here, which is what I'm looking at. Um, but again, not system-wide failure. Okay, here's another one um, that I wanted to show this time with age. Um, so when I put, when these are put, their over-organization um, rates were put into the models, what popped out as very important was biphone probability. And we put this in as a ratio. So what we did is we took the biphone probability of the correct form, the adult-like production versus the over form. And if the lines here straight up and down, if it's on the right side of the line, that means that the over form had a much higher phono, uh, biphone probability. If it's on the left, that means that the correct form did. And what's interesting here is that both Adam and Sarah at some point in their development, um, if we use age, um, were more likely to produce the over form when it had a bigger or higher biphone probability. Um, okay. Again, I know that these are two children, so we'll get to a little bit of a, some generalization here too. Okay, so like I said, we did, I did over cocoa frequency, we did looking over some length of utterance, and this was looking at some biphone probability, um, you know, and this is trying to, this is the model trying to estimate when we'll see uh, over regularization, and it seems that biphone probability is, is important. And when I did both, when I looked at both models, both models had a significant interaction between article use. So, um, I decided to, since mean length of utterance, type token ratio and age, those sophistication of the child measures were all highly correlated. Um, and we're just kind of, you know, not really showing us anything useful. I then decided to use article use um, as to, to see, you know, is that gonna do anything for us? Um, and so article use, coca frequency and biphone probability this interact, this three-way interaction is very important for both Adam and Sarah. Um, it's one that we see across the children. Okay. Now, this is what's kind of ongoing. Um, I have gone back to childless and wanted to get some more kids. Um, unfortunately, there's not much longitudinal data. That's why I only had Adam and Sarah to begin with. Um, so I wanted to use some cross-sectional data to see if we could find something similar. So um, I used the Hall corpus and this is 39 children and all of them were four nine, except one who was four six, um, which four years, nine months, four years, six months. Um, and the language samples were collected over two days and this is spontaneous speech um, and 27 children over regularized at least once. And again, just to show you the over organization rate, it's very low. Um, we're not seeing, you know, again, this is not longitudinal, so I can't really say we're not seeing um, system-wide failure, but again, low over-regularization rate. Okay, so for over-regularization over purposes, for generalization purposes, um, we fit this Hall data to the best models for Adam and Sarah. And um, Adam's model had two significant two-way interactions with the Hall data biphone probability and coca frequency and article use and biphone probability. And then Sarah's model had one, which was biphone probability and coca frequency. So we see that across the children with this Hall data, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so just this cross-sectional data of 27 kids who over regularize um, the mixed model, um, if you put it into the models that were the best for Adam and Sarah, we see this, this two-way interaction being important um, in, in both Adam and Sarah's model with Hall data. Okay. All right, so this is ongoing. I, um, try, I'm trying to add, so these kids were four years, nine months. I wanted to see younger kids, but there's just not that many they don't over that much in younger years. So it's really hard 
to get any sort of model fit to younger data, um, but still looking. So we'll see what we can do with the younger data and if that's at all predictive. Um, but at four years, nine months, it seems like this data is fitting really well with Adam and Sarah's models that were used over a long time. So over two, when they were two years to five years. Okay. So what is the nature of the development of regular past tense? And is it best described as a U-shaped learning function? I mean, there was some evidence of the U-shaped learning development, but it seemed like these micro U-shapes, this dip, um, it certainly wasn't a system-wide failure. Uh, we didn't see it over all of the verbs at all. Um, in fact, most irregular verbs in the child, the children's verb vocabulary were not over-regularized. Um, okay. And can we estimate, estimate the likelihood of over based on qualities outside of morphosyntax, perhaps inherent or unique to the verb, like um, biphone probability? Uh, yes, it seems that way. This is still ongoing, but I think it's really promising. Um, over Overregularization in production seems to be driven by the production mechanism, um, not the, um, the morphosyntactic system. So it seems like forms that are easier to produce or not easier to produce, but make it more English-like. So whenever, when overregularized forms are more like English and have higher pro probabilities, um, phonotactic probabilities, kids are more likely to produce these forms than their correct counterpart because they have lower phonotactic probabilities. So they're less English-like. This cut's kind of weird, you know? I'm just thinking about how these, these forms um, sound and, you know, where they fit into our lexicon as adults. But, you know, I think catch sounds great now. So I often say it on accident, because again, 10 years, 10 years of looking at forms like catch when it's not in my dialect. <laughs> okay, conclusions. We've made it, we've almost made it. <laughs> okay, so children's behavior in our behavioral study, the three conditions, suggests that the English verbal paradigm, um, which is so weak, <laughs> is, is small compared to other verbal paradigms. So I would love to do this with other languages. Um, the S, the ING, and the ED seem to be a strong enough um, influence in 16 month olds' expectations that they treat the gap in their input of forms like catch and break as accidental. Um, so they treat it like dance when we saw on the Adam's corpus that it was, you know, they're just like, this was never produced. It doesn't mean that I can't do it. So at this stage, it seems to me like they're using, that these are accident, they think they're accidental gaps and it's not linguistically motivated. And when children then are starting to produce these forms in production, these are not driven by morphosyntactic change and the learning of a rule or of an abstraction of a rule. Um, it's driven by the production mechanism and it's in, an interaction of phonotactics, frequency, and the linguistic sophistication of the child as measured by article use um, instead of reflecting some sort of new morphosyntactic knowledge. And so going back to the idea that it's a fairy tale that the past tense story we hear in textbooks is a U-shaped learning function, I think we need to change the narrative. Um, now we see that at 16 months that children have a sensitivity to the linguistic structure of past tense verbs plus e, or verbs plus the past tense ed. Um, and then at 24 months, when we see these in productions, uh, in production, we um, we'll see the both correct form and the overregularized form. But when we do see the overregularized form, um, this is influenced by the phonotactics and linguistic sophistication of the child, not by morphosyntactic knowledge that is just emerging. And so they go on between 36 and 60 months, um, still doing this and again, still influenced by the production mechanism. And finally, at 60 months plus, these overregularizations will decrease and disappear if they aren't part of the child's dialect. 
So with future directions, um, this is something that got halted a little bit because of COVID, <laughs> but um, right now we're working on the semantics because currently we didn't look, or the data that I showed you wasn't looking at whether or not kids actually know what these verbs mean. Um, so we're trying to see if they know, know what broke or break means. So we have pictures like this that we're showing them. It was working good in person. We tried to do it over Zoom and you know, 16 months don't care. They, they don't care about this. Um, so it's okay, it's okay. Um, actually the problem is, is that the screen is just too small to see which way they're looking, what picture they're looking at. Um, they find the pictures quite cute, but um, so that's gonna probably be halted until we can do in-person unless I can figure out some way to, to test this um, over Zoom. We have had success with other studies, 11 month and 20 month studies in our lab. So maybe there's hope. Um, and then another future direction would be how children ultimately decide that some forms never occur in their language so that it's linguistically uh, motivated and not an accidental gap. Um, that I have no idea when, I mean, perhaps there's some sort of threshold of input or use that they meet where they decide that there are two different kinds of gaps in, in paradigms. Um, but that's definitely an open question, an interesting question. Um, so here's where I will pause for, or not pause, but stop uh, for questions and comments. And those are my beautiful dogs who I believe did not bark the entire time, which is a small miracle. Um, and also before I go, here's a picture of me when I started producing over regularizations. I don't know, this is three. Um, <laughs> and so social media that you can follow, um, and you can jot down my email uh, if you want to ask questions, you not feel comfortable in this forum to do so. So I'll stop sharing and then we can do this. All right. Thanks, Megan, so much. Thank you. This is terrific. I am going to um, stop the stream and then I'll also um, go ahead and stop